Hey, welcome back, super smarties. Let the learning begin. So let's move up the information on the calendar that can be moved up and let's extract whatever's new that we need off the smart chart and the smart card. First, let's check in. Remember, this is block talk, so find your zone of regulation. Hopefully you're in green, regulated and ready to learn. I'm going to borrow Mind Shift from Andy in Transitional Kindergarten. And here's what Andy came up with. Now, when she was at Hobby Lobby, she found this, this kind of form of dough that's called um, Silly Putty. It's been around a really, really, really long time. And what's cool about it is, it looks kind of like gum, like chewing gum. It doesn't. It feels a little like chewing gum, but not quite as sticky. And then you pull it. And when I was little, if you had the comics from Sunday, like the Sunday comics, you could lay over the Sunday comics and press it down. It would pick up the ink off of the page. And then you could see your comic on the back of the Silly Putty. And then when you rolled it back into itself, it would just disappear. So it was kind of magical how it would kind of lift it off. Now they still make it, apparently. And it comes in something like an Easter egg, like a little plastic egg. So again, you could use an actual egg, like what we did, crack the egg. So that would work well for both of these mind shifts. Otherwise, what you could also do is just pretend that you have it. So since I don't have an actual egg of putty, I'm going to pretend that I do. And she called it playful putty. So she took it, cracked open the egg, then took out the putty. And you're going to move the putty from hand to hand and knead it. So when you're kneading it, you're going to just breathe. Put it in the other hand. And you can also pull the putty. So you can pull it like this. So you can knead it. And you can pull it. And that's a good way to regulate. If you're green, ready to learn and regulate it. All right, so yesterday was the first day of the week, which makes it reference down Sunday. So I'm going to give myself a face space. This will be base, the face space. Yesterday was capital S-U-N-D-A-Y. Put a period, that's in the past. I can check my smart card. Sunday, remember it's compound word. Two little words, get together, make a big word. Day is. I'm going to move down and I see Monday, capital M-O-N-D-A-Y, period. And I'm going to check my chart, Sunday, go down one, Monday, and then I'm going to erase it. Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, tomorrow will be Tuesday. If yesterday was Sunday, today is Monday. Tomorrow will be Tuesday. Capital T U E S D A Y. Yesterday was Sunday. It's in the past. Today is Monday. It's in the present. Tomorrow will be Tuesday. It's in the future. And I'm going to move my smart card so that I can make sure that it's correct for tomorrow. Sunday, Monday. So we're listening for it. Mm, like as in mittens. And there's only one day of the week that starts with Monday with an M. So it's Monday and I see an M. Monday. Remember, if we can remember the chunk at the end and that all the days of the week end with day, the only part we have to remember is what's called the onset, the beginning part. Monday. And this is the uh of love. I'll move my card down. And one of the things that I have my kiddos do is work on high frequency words. High frequency words are words you see frequently, which means a lot, in, in text that you read and when you write. 
And so the first 10, the first six, we made the red card. So that's our, those are our red words. And we go fishing for fluency. So these are our red words. I can see a, now we're back to I, and there's two more, we and the. So what I want to do today is I want to use some of those words in a sentence. And when I read them, you maybe heard a sentence. I can see a, a would be singular, and I can reference the words. So I'm building a sentence using high frequency words. Now some of these words are also sight words. They can't be sounded out, so you have to memorize them. I is not a sight word, it's a high frequency word. It happens a lot, but you can sound it out, it says its name. Can, not a high, not, not a sight word because you can sound it out, and, but it is a high frequency word. C, you just have to know that there's another E, but it follows the rules in reading and writing. Two vowels are walking, one, they go, the first one does the talking and always says its name, C. So that is also not a sight word. And a uh, or A, if you use a uh, the way we do in my class, then you could say, well, well, it can be sounded out because a uh, is one of the sounds that A makes unless you don't recognize it or you don't learn that as one of the sounds it makes. I teach it, so we can sound this out too. And if you call it by its name, which many people do, A, then it's not a word that you have to just memorize. But the faster that you memorize them and put them into automaticity where you can just retrieve them really quickly, the faster you will be writing and reading them. Okay, so I'm going to have my little friend here. Hi, friend. I'm the spelling bee and I'm back. Okay, so I can see a spelling bee, but we're just going to make them a bee. I can see a bee. So there's just five words. Remember, in between each word, there's space. We know that now as social distancing, and we need punctuation at the end, so it needs a stopping mark. And it's just a simple sentence. So I big capital letter I, can, face space, C, A, N, face space, C, S, E, B, A, and then I'm going to sound it out, B, 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 E, B, E, I hear two sounds, B, E, this rhymes with C, and I see two E's at the end of C, and the word B adds in the spelling bee it has two e's at the end, and it's just a telling sense. I'm just going to put a period at the end, and then I'm going to make a little rebus picture. So I'm going to draw the spelling bee. I can see a bee. So I've taken my high frequency words, I've linked them together into a sentence. And then I've illustrated my sentence. So here is my message, and it's, or here's my meaning. I've written the message here, and it has the meaning, and then I've supported it by my illustration. I didn't draw a zebra because I didn't say I could see a zebra, even if I can. I need to draw a picture that correlates or represents the words that I've written next to it. So now I'm going to take other words from my red, my red group my red strand, and I'm going to make another sentence. Now, I needed another word. I didn't want to use a word I've already used, so I reached over to the orange, the orange strand, and I'm going to add like to this one. We like, we like the. Now this is a high frequency word and also a dun 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 sight word. You cannot sound it out. The T and the H get together, and they say, it's called a digraph. Now, the way we remember it in my class, and this is just something silly I made up, we say the two letters get together, they die to their original sound, they graph together and make a new sound. The, the, take a picture. 
because this doesn't make any sense. You have to remember it by sight. High frequency because it happens in like 50% of, of what we write and read. You're going to see this as one of the highest 10 that you would find in those texts that you would write and that you would read. But, can't sound it out. It looks like he or to. So the. We like the. We, so I'm going to sweep back. I'm going to make my sentence, and my sentence, my words are going to carry the meaning. And the picture always has a message, but I am giving a message in what I'm writing. We like. I have to remember there's an E at the end. Throw, jumps over the K and gives all of its power over the I, making long and strong and strange and name. I, I, I. We like the. Ooh, I remember T, H, the digraph, and then an E. We like the. Um, who we like is, there he is, he just settled down right here, come on baby, she, it's actually a she, we like the, remember, kids, Dot, the dictionary dog, it's Dr. Dot, Spot is her first name, hi, hi, I spot you, Spot can always spot Dot, that's funny, huh, Dr. Spot Dot. The dictionary dog can always spot the meaning of a word. So we like the dog. I'm going to put that on my listening arm too. Dog. Remember I put it up my arm, my non-dominant arm. I write with my right hand. So I go up my left arm into my smart brain. And the sounds come out the arm that's going to lead to my hand that holds the pen that's going to write the word on the page. So d-a-g, d-a-g, d the beginning is a D. And remember, B is very what? Bad. He will not face his dad. I don't want to look at you. But D is very, very glad. She will always face her dad. I love looking at you. So face, face. D. Oh. Stretch out the middle sound. Oh. Dog. Punch the ending sound. Dog. Dog. G, and this is a dangle down letter. It goes down into the basement. It looks like an A until it reaches down and kicks its little foot to the side. And I'm not going to make it this look like spot. This is how I make it up. I learned this from Petey Eastman. I'm reading Petey Eastman books. Where's my dog? We like the dog. I can see a B. Yesterday was Sunday, today is Monday, tomorrow will be Tuesday. Remember, you want to add this to your composition book. If you do it every day, your composition book should get very full. This one that I provided for my students has 80 pages. And if you're doing it as a spread where you put some of the information here, and then some on the back where you put some on the left and some on the right, you only have 40 days, which means I'm going to have to provide my kids one pretty soon because we are out of school now 30, a little more than 30, because we left on the 13th, 14, 15, 16. We started doing this on about the 18th. So we're getting getting closer, closer to filling up the book. But if you use the front and the back, then you have 80 days, and this will carry you all the way through the end of the school year. We have 32 more days of school, but if I record on the weekends, that's going to add some extra days. And I may just keep recording over the summer so that my Smarties and anyone who joins us has a chance to continue to build their schema before they go back to school in the fall. All right, so make sure that you've transferred this into your notebook or to your composition book or a piece of paper, preferably not a white mat or a whiteboard. And get on the bus. Honk, honk, beep, beep. Psh. Doors open, you don't want to be left behind. Let's go on a learning field trip. Build up your schema. Climb on the bus. All right, so we're going to take an English language art field trip. We're going to extend our learning from writing our sentence. Oh, no, I guess we're going to take a math one. Surprise of all surprises. You know what got confusing to me? Because I looked up and I saw words. When I say words, I think of English language art. Oh, my goodness. Sometimes the lines blur over. 
So this is kind of what's called a hybrid lesson. So we're really looking at a math concept, but we have to use our smart word brain. We have to toggle between the numbers and the words here because just like we were using high frequency words to write our sentences, we are going to have to, have to recognize number words to be able to complete our math exercise. Whoa, mathematicians, you really do have to be a mathematician to be able to do this. Let's math it up. Gotta love math, how it doesn't stay in its own lane, just jumps over here. Okay, so if you look at the top, I made a support strip at the top. And sometimes when you have a paper at school, you'll see a support strip at the top or at the bottom. Sometimes you'll cut them off and you have to cut out the information and move it onto the page where it belongs. But obviously I can't cut out my whiteboard, move it on the page. So we are going to use the support strip at the top to answer the information that's requested at the bottom. So if I look at the top, I see a number string. It starts at one and it ends at seven and it is a count sequence, and it is an ascending, getting bigger order. So I see a one, a two, a three, a four, a five, a six, and a seven. When I look below them, I see a word, and it's a number word. So since this is one, I have to assume this is one, and I know a song for one. O-N-E, that spells one. O-N-E, that spells one. So it matches. So O-N-E spells one. Now, one of the things you might want to do with this is move it into a composition book or onto a piece of paper and start practicing putting the number word with the number, the number word with the number. What would be great is to take little cards and make flashcards and cut them out like a puzzle. Maybe use a marker in between and cut them zigzag or straight across to where you would have to match them up or even play concentration where you turn them upside down and you flip them over and you have to match them. So if you keep this in a strip like this, you can use it as a smart strip. You could make a chart out of it. You can also make flashcards out of it, smart cards. So a lot of the things that we do, you can push into extended learning. And I want to tell you right up front, this is something really smart for you to do. All of the activities that we're doing here, you can extend that learning at home by playing it with someone who's bigger than you or by you making it and then bringing someone bigger than you or even someone littler than you and then checking to see if they can figure out what it was that you were trying to have them extract as their information. So T-W-O is two, T-H-R-E-E -E spells three, F-O-U-R, that spells four, F-I-V-E, that spells five, S-I-X spells six, S-E-V-E-N, S-E-V-E-N, that spells seven. So now I know that these words match these numbers. So if I need to know where seven is, I can just quickly identify the digit of seven, or I can count down the number strip, and I can see the word below it has to support it. Again, this is a little like the picture carries the message and the word carries the meaning. This is the meaning of this. But these are two very abstract concepts. So once I understand one of them, I can easily connect the other piece of information. That's what I when I talk to you about connecting schema and building a schematic, this is how we connect schema. This is our prior learning. We know that these digits mean, well, this means this many, one face big. So now I'm taking the number word and extending what I know about the number one so this is a value of one. This represents, this symbol represents this amount. And this word represents this amount and this symbol. So that's stretching our schema and tacking on and building onto it. So this is telling me to circle. It's not finding a circle. The directions are circle five, circle F-I-V-E. So when I see F-I-V-E, I'm going to look up here for F. No, 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 the first letter has to be F. Yes, F-I, no, F-O, no, that's not it. F-I-V-E, circle five, five. One, two, three, four, five. Now remember, you can also reference your touch map. We made a chart with touch map. So you can remember, and you could do that with this, make it larger. I didn't, because that's a lot of concept to put into one 
micro lesson. Now it becomes this macro lesson. So one, two, three, four, five. That helps us know how many is five. One, two, three, four, five. This is how many would represent five. How many are five? There are five. This is the amount of five. So now I'm going to come back to the kisses. They look like X's, but they really stand for kisses. Teacher kisses. One, two, three, four, five. So if I'm circling five, that means I'm not going to circle all of them because there are more than five. And when I circle or put a ring around them, I'm going to connect them. I mean, I could cut, do one here, one here, one here, one here, one here, and one there. But I don't want to do that. I want to circle them, so I'm going to put a continuous ring around five and only five. So one, two, three, four, and five. How many are there all together? Did you, did you count them? How many does it look like there are? If this is five, does it look like there's an equal number? An unequal number, because we've referenced that on another video as well. Equal, same amount, unequal, more or less in one set than the other. How many? Are you sure? Do you know for sure? How can you know for sure? What strategy can you use as a mathematician? Count them. So we have five here. Let's put five in our head and count on. Because we already counted them, we don't need to recount them. We know that this ring is holding five, so don't count those first five. So put it in your head. We're going to put five in our head and count on. Six, seven, eight, nine. There are ten. Now I can project or predict that there are probably going to be ten in each of those rows, but I can't know for sure if they aren't exactly lined up. Now these aren't lined up, so there might it might be that there's only nine. So let's count and find out how many are in the next row. One, two, three, four, five. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten. But they weren't lined up, so I couldn't be sure. So based on what we already know, the prior information, what do you expect you're going to find in the third row? Probably ten. And how can we know for sure? Count them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Now am I going to circle all of them in any of the rows? If you said no, you're correct. How come I'm not going to? Defend your answer. When we look at our sentence, our sentence strip, when we look at our number strip, our support strip up here, do we see 10 represented? So the highest number that this is going to ask me about is seven. So that's called an inference. I take the information I know and I can infer that I'm not going to find, they're not going to ask me for anything that they haven't provided me with support for. Unless this was a test and they were trying to extend my, extend their awareness of what I knew. So now let me look at the next one. Circle, same word, circle. And it's not find a circle, it's circle, put a ring around it. T-W-O. Now I'm looking for T at the beginning. Nope, 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 nope. Oh, look, here's a T, here's a T. So it's narrowed between these two. It's three letters long, so even without looking at the next letters, just knowing it begins with a T and it's three letters long, I can use that to very quickly eliminate one, exclude it, and find out which one I'm looking for. One, two, three. Oh, if I can count beyond three, it can't be this one. One, two, three. One, two, three. And then I can check the digits that I see or the letters that I see. Not. I can check the numbers, but I've got to first look at the letters. Oh my gosh, what do we know about me? I made another what? Mistake. If I'm awake, I'm making a mistake. That's expected, right? And now I'm going to inspect it because when I'm talking about symbolic information, letters are symbols and so are numbers, and we're going between numbers and letters, it's super confusing. These symbols all mixed up. It's like alphabet soup or number soup, if there is such thing. And so it needs to be respected because they help us learn. It is really hard as a learner to differentiate between the different symbols because they're all what's called abstract. It's just, you have to memorize them all and keep them all in your head and remember which word defines them. So that is very confusing. And I'm a really big person who's learned for a really long time and I got confused. So is it okay for you to get confused too? Yes. The more you practice and the more you use it, 
the more it lives in automaticity. But even when it lives in automaticity, sometimes your brain gets confused and your mouth says the wrong thing. All right, so now I know that this has three letters. <laughs> it's three letters, and it's the word two. Again, more confusion. T-W-O. So when I looked up here, I saw T-W-O was below the digit of two. So how many am I going to circle or put a ring around? T-W-O, two, one, two. One, two. So how many did I not circle? Because when we look at math, we want to look at what we capture, but we also want to look at what we release. So how many did I not include? Because this is the early process of addition and subtraction. If I put these two together, I knew there were 10. I've taken two and I've circled it, so I'm, I need to kind of subitize. Subitize is where I see number, the whole number, but I see it as pieces together. Two and how many more? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight more. Here I had five and I saw 10, because there were 10, as five and five more. This is two and eight more. So that's early addition and subtraction. So it's really important to be flexible with numbers that when I'm doing math, I'm always thinking about math, not just in the context of how I'm looking at it right now, but in all the other ways I can also see it. Because that's how you're going to do math when you get to higher math. There's a lot of processes to get to an, a single answer. You have to go through a lot, like a maze. You have to go through a lot of different fun, different kinds of ways to solve math to get to an answer. So by being flexible now, it will help you be more flexible later. All right, so now I see circle again, circle, circle, circle. Those are all the same, so they're asking me to do the same task. And I see an S. Looking at the first letter, oh, here's an S and here's an S. One, two, three, four, five. So I'm looking for five letters. Wait, one, two, three, four, five. Yeah, it's five letters. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three. Okay, so it's five. And look, there's a word hiding in it. We say seven, but it looks like the word of even, and seven is actually odd. So who put the even in the seven when the seven is odd? That is odd, right? Super confusing. Okay, so now we want to ring seven. One, and I could look here. Two, that's not enough. Five is not enough, but seven is two more than five. So if I could subitize and see five here and two more, five and two more, is seven. And I can also count to check. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So what I could do is put a line here and come the other way. Rather than ringing from the front to the back, I could count to the end and then hold it by ringing backwards so I don't have to count it twice. And how many are left? If I subitize 10 here, I see 10 as seven. Uh-oh. Look. I didn't do it quite right. Seven and one, two, three more. So it's really important that you count and you count again and you check and you recheck because sometimes in math when they're sitting close together like that, I thought I saw it as seven and then I realized it didn't look quite like a seven and then when I was testing it and saw how many were left, that's the other reason for checking because it's another way to check to make sure because I thought I did seven. I was sure I did seven. And then when I went to count how many were left, there should have only been three and I could see four. So I had to recheck what was in my ring. Those are strategies you want to use as a mathematician. Remember what we learned about math is when you make mistakes in math and you persevere through it, your brain compresses that information. Those are called compressions. Making mistakes in math is critical to becoming mathematical. You only become a flexible thinker when your brain can hold a lot of mathematical information. And the only way it can hold all that big math is that it compresses it and makes it smaller. And the only way it can make compressions is by you making a lot of mistakes. But then staying with it, you have to persevere. You have to stay in it, even when it's hard and it feels frustrating and it can feel like it hurts your head. You have to stay in it because that's how your brain gets from little math to big math, is with those compressions that are made when you make a mistake. So you really do learn by making mistakes especially in math. Now this is asking me a different question, and yet it isn't. It's saying the same thing a different way. 
This told me to circle seven, which means I needed to find seven. But this is asking me how many. So now what I need to do is I need to look at the pictures and count all of them. I start with the first one. When I stop with the last one, the last number that I say is the total number that there are in all. And that will be the value of the whole set. That will tell me how many. One, two, three. So now I need to find a three up here. One, two, three. And I'm not wanting to record this numerically. I'm wanting to record it with a word, with the alphabetical representation of this number. So now I need to reference up and come down. T H R E E. And I could put a three here, go right around the tree, right around the tree. That makes three. Both of these symbolic representations equal the same value of this. This is just using letters and this is using numbers. Now this is also asking me the same question, how many? I see one, two, three, four, down and over right and down some more, that makes four. So I'm going to come up one, two, three, four and go down F-O-U-R. F-F-O-U-R, that spells four. F-O-U-R, that spells four. Now this is going to get very tricky. This is big math, it's called a word problem. Take three away. Okay, so I need to take three away. One, two, three. Now, how many are left? So I had four, I took three away. So I could tell a little story. Four kitties went out to play in the park. Three kitties got sleepy and went home. How many kitties are left? And how many do you see? There's just one kitty all alone. One, O-N-E. O-N-E, that spells one. O-N-E spells number one. Okay, now write the equation. So what I had here was four kitties take away or minus three kitties equals how many kitties in all? One kitty is left. That's called horizontal side to side. I can also do this problem vertically. Four kitties minus or take away one kitty. Now this equal the line over the line, when you draw it vertically, you just draw one big line separating the information from the top from the answer at the bottom equals three kitties. And if I sabotage, I could say four, and I'm going to put it in a number bond, and I'm going to break it apart. Take away three equals one. This says exactly the same thing as this. It just says it in a different way. Which number did we not use above? Oh my goodness, I wasn't keeping track of what we were doing. Now I have to figure out number, which means it's only one, that's singular. So that should make it a little bit easier. I didn't know we used all of them though. So how are we going to figure out which number we used? Hmm, we're gonna have to reference our number strip. So let's think about this. We have to know what we didn't use, which means we have to find out what we did use. And we have to record some way what we did use so we can find out what we didn't use. Oh, math is really a magical trick, isn't it? It's like a little puzzling riddle. Whew, I love riddles and I love puzzles and I love math. It's awesome. It's a universal language. Everyone speaks it. Some of us just don't speak it as fluently, but we're getting better at it. All right, so let me start here. Circle five. So we can eliminate what? Five. And what I'm gonna do is I'm going to put, I guess I'll put a little X on it. Kiss it goodbye. We already used that information, so it's not five. Circle two. Okay, kiss two goodbye. One, two. Now we've eliminated two of the numbers. Circle seven. So seven is at the end of our support strip. How many? Three. One, two, three. Ooh, we have one, two, three left. This is kind of a fun game, huh? How many? Four. One, two, three, four. F-O-U-R. Okay, and three, we already used. And one is the first one. 
Okay, that's everything that we did. And I see one of the numbers has not been kissed goodbye. What is it? Not one, not two, not three, not four, not five, not seven. It is, drum roll please, process of elimination. It's number six. So I'm going to put a six here. Add a left angle, come down, loop right around. That's how we get our kicks when we make a six. And I'm going to write the number word, S-I-X. S-I-X. Wow, wasn't that awesome? That's crazy. I just feel my brain feels kind of heavy, but it also feels kind of swollen and big, like more information is living in there. Now what I need to do is go to sleep, because memory is made in sleep, so if I sleep right now, then I'll remember all this stuff really well. So that is why you never study, study, and then go right and take a test. You study and you sleep, and you get up and study some more, and then you sleep some more. Then you go take the test after you've studied again, and it should be living in your memory. Seals it up in memory. Brain, I guess, is focused on what you just spent time working on. Just like when you eat and your tummy digests the food, when you think, your brain digests all the information, and you build your schema bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And bigger. This was awesome. Thank you for sharing this lesson with me. I look forward to sharing more information on later lessons. Until then, here's some prize. And don't take any more of my schema because that was a that was a big thinking. I'm gonna need that. I'm gonna have to go learn some more things. So I still have something in my head. Although this was pretty big information. Big. Okay, here's love. You can save that for later unless you need some now. Like I, I think I need a hug. Ah, oh, it's the best thing. You can just give yourself a hug. Whew, that was big thinking. We really persevered. That's one of the math practices, is staying with it, even when it's hard. Hmm. Grit is what that's called, and tenacity. We've got grit and tenacity. We stayed with this. Excellent. All right, say goodbye to Dot. <laughs> say goodbye to Spelling Bee. <laughs> and say goodbye to me, Super Teacher. Ow, ow, ow. Look, I'm confused. Ow.